If you're looking for proven ways to take your fundraising results to the next level, you're in the right place. Welcome to the Intentional Fundraiser Podcast, hosted by Tammy Zonker. Tammy has trained and led thousands of nonprofit organizations to collectively raise more than a half billion dollars and is also recognized as one of America's top 20 fundraising experts. This is the podcast where Tammy equips and empowers amazing fundraising pros like you to transform your fundraising so you can transform the world. And now, let's hear from Tammy. We'll start the show in just a moment after a word from our sponsor. Support for this show is brought to you by our friends at Bloomerang. Bloomerang offers donor management and online fundraising software that helps small to medium nonprofits, just like First Tee of Greater Akron, a nonprofit that empowers kids and teens through the game of golf. After just one year with Bloomerang, First Tee of Greater Akron doubled their unique donors, improved donor stewardship, and raised more funds. Keep listening to hear how they did it or visit bloomerang.com forward slash intentional to learn more. Again, that's bloomerang.com forward slash intentional. Today, I welcome Helen Brown to the show. Helen is the president of the Helen Brown Group, a fundraising intelligence consulting firm based in Watertown, Massachusetts. In 2021, she also founded Definitive, a research resource for donor advised funds. Helen is co author of the book, Prospect Research for Fundraisers The Essential Handbook, of which I have a copy, a very dog eared copy, I might mention. She is past board member and longtime volunteer for both APRA. That's the Association of Prospect Researchers for Advancement, and NADRA. That's the New England Development Research Association. And of course, she's a frequent speaker for APRA and its chapters, as well as other fundraising professional associations. Helen is special advisor on fundraising to the board of the North American Foundation for the University of Manchester and a fellow of the Royal Society for Arts and Manufacturers in London. Helen received her Nidra and Castle Award for Service to the Prospect Research Community in 2006 and the APRA Distinguished Service Award in 2017. And I would say after following Helen and her work for a couple of decades at least, how I would describe her is quietly brilliant. Welcome to the show, Helen. Oh no, what do I say after that? Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me and happy Prospect Research Pride Month. I don't know if you know, but March is Research Pride, which actually I founded nine years ago to help elevate just awareness of prospect research, to bring up some pride in our community, to help us advocate for ourselves, and also just to make sure that we as a community are getting the word out there about the ways that prospect development can help nonprofit organizations raise more money. I did not know that. And thank you for starting that movement. Excellent. Let's jump into some of the questions. You know, some people fall into the fundraising profession, maybe as a second career, while others are far more intentional about choosing the profession. Tell me, how did you come to the profession of fundraising, Helen? I think I was probably the luckiest person in the world. I fell into prospect research. I had just graduated from college and I was an English and a French major trying to figure out what I wanted to do. I knew that I always wanted to do something that had to do with research. It had been something that I had really enjoyed as an undergraduate, but you know, it's not like there's a career path for for learning what research is. And as a kid, my parents had always been involved with our local community and the church and soup kitchens and all that sort of thing. So philanthropy had always been kind of a part of my life too. So I graduated from college. I was trying to figure out what I was going to do. I took a job at a temp agency, my first and last job at a temp agency, because they placed me in the development office for my alma mater, UNC Chapel Hill. And my first day on the job, I was answering phones. I was literally the receptionist. And the director of research came up to me and said, hey, you're just sitting there with nothing to do. You want to do a little research for us? 
And that was it. That was it. I was hook, line, and sinker, found my profession. It was just a matter of dumb luck. And I can't believe how lucky I was. It normally takes many of us a lot longer to find our calling and our niche. And and you found it right out of college. I absolutely love that. Research and philanthropy, you know, two things that were part of my core. It was destiny. Well, Helen, many of our listeners work in small to medium-sized shops, typically budgets maybe somewhere between $2 million and $10 million. And many of them don't have a staff member dedicated to prospect research or donor development or overall donor analytics kind of on their wish list. What advice do you have for them? How do they get started with prospect research and prospect development? Well, they're probably already doing research, whether they know it or not. It's really just a matter of, is the fundraiser doing it or do they have somebody else who's trained to do it? I would say for some people, they're just kind of skeptical about research. They don't know it. They've never had it. They don't know if it would make a difference. And what's one of those kind of questions? I mean, we do research. We assume that it is a good thing and that it's helping organizations. But there was actually recently a study that came out of the University of Kent Center for Philanthropy that actually did a study on the impact of prospect research. And What they said overwhelmingly, they interviewed fundraisers, and what they said was that they raise more money, they do it more efficiently, and they do it with donors that are better qualified when they have access to research than when they don't. So that's just kind of a sort of a grounding on, you know, is research even worth it? I will tell you that it is, but actually now there's a study that shows that there is a value to prospect research. If I can just pause for a moment to just say, that's the kind of data that can help us make a case to our executive leadership or our board about why investment in prospect research definitely has a return that we can quantify. So powerful. Yeah, absolutely. And like I said, for, for years, we just, we went on the assumption that it helped. When we're working in organizations, we see our own impact because we track the work that we do and that sort of thing. But to have a study done that actually says, yes, this really does work is a nice validation of our work as well. I would say for organizations that are trying to figure out how do we even get started? Like, how do I know what to even ask for or what to do? I would say that one of the biggest questions is, okay, I've got a great prospect. I think that I could ask them for this amount. I know what they're interested in, and I know that they're involved. I know that they're engaged, but I'm trying to figure out, are we talking 50000 or are we talking 500000 here? That sort of thing. That's a really great time to maybe go to a freelance researcher, maybe go to a company that specializes in research and just say, can you give me a profile? And then not just say, can you just give me a general profile, but also to say, here are the specific things that I would like to know because the researcher is going to be able to give them back information that's much more tailored to what they want to know. You know, you ask for a profile on Bill Gates, you're going to get 25 pages. But if you say, this is the thing that I want you to look at, they're going to be able to hone in and give you the answers that you need. So I would just say, if you're going to ask for research, just be really specific about what it is that you're looking for, because then that person knows what to look for. Great advice. And I know that so many of the Donor management systems have wealth screening built into them right now, but real prospect research goes well beyond just that fundamental prospect, like rating and screening of potential capacity. Can you speak a little bit more to that, like what else you look for or can feed back to nonprofits when they give you specific requests? Sure. One of the things that there's sort of different traits of a good prospect researcher. You need to have natural curiosity. You need to kind of be tenacious a little bit in looking for pieces of information. But in order to be a really good prospect researcher, to be able to give an organization the kind of information that they really need, you need to understand the context within which the prospect works, right? So what what does their life look like? What are their interests philanthropically and just as people? Who do they move with? Who are their friends? How do they move? Do they live in one part of the world, one part of the year, and then another? So 
the questions that you ask yourself about when you're doing research on someone is you really want to get a 360 degree view, not for every single prospect, but for the ones that you're particularly honing in on. You need to understand the context within which that person lives and the money moves in that type of person's, whether it's private equity mm -hmm. or whatever it is. You also need to understand the context within which your nonprofit is. You know, you have to understand what are our mission? What's our goals? What's our fundraising goals? What do we need in order to be successful? Because that will help you as a prospect development professional be able to say, I know that you've asked me for this thing, but what I see our goals are this thing. And so I want to be able to help move us in this direction. And so to be able to take a little bit of initiative in terms of how you help your organization get from here to there. And so I hope that that answers your question, but really it's not just sort of looking at the information always that's just in front of you, but it's always having a context of what are you working within and how can you get the right answer to that person that's the thing that they really need in order to do their jobs. Because sometimes I find that fundraisers ask us for things that is what they think that they need and we should give them that but we should also give them more around that that will help them be able to look at the information and go oh okay so i see that maybe asking that person for a donation in january isn't a good idea because they get their bonus in april so maybe i need to be thinking about that solicitation in a different way timing wise so smart and what it really to me draws attention to is that this actually doing the research and putting together a thoughtful plan. It really does take a lot of intention, and it's not something you do at the last minute. <laughs> not well. <laughs> no, no, not well. I mean, it's obviously the president is going to get a meeting in two days with someone, and then it's all hands on Absolutely. deck. You've got to get what that person needs in order to to be ready for that meeting. But really the best way that prospect development works, and when I say prospect development, just to be clear, I mean research, prospect management, data analytics, and due diligence. Those are sort of the four legs that the prospect development table consists of. In order to really have a functioning prospect development program with an organization, the people in those functions need to understand what the overall goals are so that they can really help you move forward. And sometimes that's on a really short time scale. And sometimes it's just being involved in strategic planning and saying, okay, so five years down the road, we need to be there. So that means that we need to back up and we need to have this many prospects at this particular level ready to go and rated in those pools. So that means that I need to do these things now in mm. order to be ready for that then. So yes, you're absolutely right. Saying, okay, we're ready to go with the campaign. And not having those things in place or having those people as part of those conversations means that you're always going to be behind the eight ball trying to catch up. Yeah, it really does point to like quality work and predictably higher realized gifts will result in from better planning, right? And the truth is when we start these campaigns, we develop a gift range chart. We begin identifying names that realized gift to prospect, like these names are on our radar. Well, sometimes they are, and sometimes there yeah. are gifts. And by that, I mean things that you do to get prepared for a, a campaign, like, for example, a wealth screening or predictive analytics or some sort of modeling that you might do to get ready for a campaign. These are all things that you need to sort of start in those beginning conversations about, okay, what does a campaign look like? Because campaign council will come in, they will interview the very top prospects, but there are prospects that are within every organization's database that they might be signaling, I'm here, I'm ready to be involved, but they mm -hmm. just haven't been pulled out because they're not currently volunteers or they're not friends of the board or they're just unknown quantities or maybe they're new or maybe they're people or companies or foundations or donor advised funds that are in the community and haven't been brought on in a total sort of resource development kind of way, thinking more broadly about our community. So 
yes, there are people that we know and people that we need to make sure that we involve early on, but there are also people that we don't no, there's the known knowns, the known unknowns, <laughs> and the unknown unknowns. And sometimes prospect research can really help with the known unknowns and the unknown unknowns. The Chronicle of Philanthropy, the cover story last month, I think the title was The Mega Donor Living Next Door, which really talks about those hidden gems, people with capacity and demonstrated love of your mission who are in your database who just simply haven't been inspired to make a more significant gift. Yeah. And I was just working with a client yesterday who was talking about through their guided or feasibility study process, their prospective donors identified other people who would absolutely be interested in getting involved. And so I think that those people fall into your unknown, unknown enough. <laughs> unknown, unknown, unknown. Yeah. yeah. Such a great yeah. point. Well, Helen, you brought up predictive analytics, and I'm curious, how has predictive analytics and artificial intelligence changed the work of prospect research and prospect development? I think that we're still a little bit too early to know in terms of artificial intelligence how that's going to play out for fundraising. It's certainly exciting. It's interesting. We're just going to have to see how it plays out. In terms of predictive analytics and wealth screenings and, and all of those, those have been tools that we have used for such a long time. And they are a tool, just like every other tool, but they help us to just be much more efficient and to narrow down, particularly when you've got a really large pool of people into segments that help us concentrate on particular groups of people. And the really nice thing about it is that you can slice and dice them in so many different ways. Are we going to look geographically? Are we going to look by people who are interested in a particular program? Are we going to look at people who have been raising their hand because the acceleration of their gifts has gone up, but we haven't really done anything to make that happen? So, you know, what's going on there? How do we identify those people? I think that those things help give us signals on who we need to pay attention to and just help us be more efficient mm -hmm. in finding mm -hmm. great prospects. So when it comes to predictive yeah. analytics or even just wealth screening and data mining, I think there's often a healthy apprehension, right, to whether people want to yeah. trust the data or not. So how accurate is the data typically and how much trust should we put into it versus looking at it as a guideline or a framework? If I had a dollar for every time that a client said to me, yeah, we did a screening, we didn't get a whole lot out of it, I'm not really sure that it was a good use of our money, I would probably be able to take myself <laughs> out for a really nice dinner. And just like everything else that we use, wealth screenings are just a tool. They are one tool. They're like a hammer. You wouldn't want to build a house without a hammer, but you certainly wouldn't want to only use hammers to build a house, right? And that's really the way that wealth screenings are. I think that people expect that they're going to do a wealth screening and it's going to tell them everything that they need to know about prospects and give them perfect ratings and actionable items right out of the box. I mean, you know, fair enough. That's kind of the hype with them. But at the end of the day, it's really just a machine matching A to A and something that might look like A, but really isn't A. I like to think about wealth screenings like a puzzle. So you come across a puzzle and maybe the outside edge has been done of the puzzle. And that's the framework that they give you when the wealth screening comes back. But there's the whole center of the beautiful picture that hasn't yet been put together. And that's really where you need a human being to be able to put all those pieces in place mm -hmm. and help make sense of them. And screenings are also kind of generic when they come to you. There's lots of tweaks that you can make. Let's say the ratings, for example. I mean, a lot of people say, yeah, we hated those ratings that came back. You can change them. You can make them fit exactly what you're looking for. But you always need a person to be able to put those pieces into the puzzle to fit it out. And then also there are going to be pieces of the puzzle that are going to be missing. For example, let me give you a more concrete example of what I'm talking about. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. Mm -hmm. 
first tee of Greater Accra needed to switch from an outdated donor management system to something more user-friendly. With Bloomerang, they found that and more. Here's Executive Director Josh Smith sharing what he likes about Bloomerang. We love Bloomerang because it's so, like, it's very user-friendly. We're able to do more because our daily tasks of thanking donors and sending thank you notes have been cut more than half because of Bloomerang. Year over year, we have raised more funds, so obviously I think Bloomerang's been a, a huge part of that. By investing in a donor management system that they actually love using, First Tee of Greater Akron was able to raise more funds and continue creating lasting change in their community. To listen to the full interview with First Tee of Greater Akron, visit bloomerang.com forward slash intentional or click the link in the show notes. So you do a wealth screening and you don't get information back on your very top prospects. And you're like, this is not terribly accurate. I know that that guy's got a lot of money. I know that that she's given a million dollars across town. Like, what's going on here? And the fact is, is that wealth screenings 15, 20 years ago were much more accurate than they are right now because people are really good about hiding their money. They put real <laughs> estate into trusts. They give anonymously. They're not as I guess out there in terms of their assets as they used to be. They're just wiser about putting things in trust. And wealth screenings cannot match to trusts. If I've got my house in the Sunshine Real Estate Trust, there's no way that a wealth screening is going to find me. Also, my name is Helen Brown. There's probably 25 Helen Browns that live within a five mile read well maybe yeah. not, but you know what I'm saying. Like Helen Brown is a very common name. If my name was Heloise Belazikian, then the match would be much more accurate. So you need to have someone to look at all of the Helen Browns that were matched and say, okay, that one's mine, that one's mine, that one's not mine, that one's mine, that one's mine. So that's why people get frustrated with the accuracy of wealth screenings because they don't have someone internally to do the follow-up validation, verification that needs to be done in order to ensure that you get the most out of a screening. Because there's so much information in screening that really, really is useful, but you have to spend the time to match it and get it in the right places. So people get frustrated, but there is a remedy for that. They either need to have someone internally who's trained to know how to use them or just outsource it to somebody who can do that for them so that they do get the most out of it. And to your point earlier in the show, you know, you've got the framework of that puzzle. You've got the outside edges put together. But as you're that human touch analyzing the beautiful picture that can emerge takes us to look at the context. As you said, do they live in a certain part of the world, certain months of the year and so on? How many children do they have in university and so on? Like, what are their commitments? What's their lifestyle? Yeah. Yeah, because as you're putting those puzzle pieces together, you're also getting information from the frontline fundraisers, from the strategy saying, okay, so you know, this part of the puzzle is would be really good for two years from now. This group would be good two years from now. These are the people that we need to concentrate on right now. And a machine can't tell you that. A human being using the machine and pulling the information out, slicing and dicing it, who knows what they're looking at, who understands the context and is given the license to be able to have an opinion to say, all right, here's what I'm seeing from the data. And here's how I think that we should parse it out in order to be most effective in getting the most money out of this mm -hmm. investment that we've made. And that's the other thing. I mean, wealth screenings are, they're not super expensive, but they're also not cheap. And so why wouldn't you want to spend the money to make sure that you get the most out of that investment rather than being unhappy with it. And also, if you've been unhappy with it once, don't be unhappy again. They're a great tool. They're one tool, but they're a great tool. Yeah, such a good point. So you mentioned that many organizations choose to outsource this function within their development office. And certainly the Helen Brown Group, this is what you do right? You do the analytics, mm. the artificial intelligence, the wealth. You put together 
the whole puzzle for organizations. You partner with organizations to do that. So give us a case study. Tell us about one of your proudest moments with a client where the partnership Mm. made something remarkable possible. There are a few things that I would say. I mean, of course, we have had the pleasure of being able to help identify prospects that have gone on to make significant gifts to organizations. And that's always a proud moment. One of the things that we offer is what we call dedicated consulting, where we have one person on our team who's matched to work with an organization. We match that person based on that we know that they're going to buy into the mission of that organization. And so in one case, someone had been working with one of our clients in that way for a couple of years. And I saw them at a conference and they came up to me and they said, oh, this person, she's the best part of our team. I was like, she's the best part of your team. I love that. Okay. I really like that. Yeah, it's very cool. I love that you feel that she belongs to you in a way. Another really great thing is that the shortest period of time that we do our dedicated consulting for is three months. We've had clients now that we've worked with in that capacity for 12 years. In some cases, we have more longevity in that organization in terms of staffing than the folks that are there. And we've become their institutional memory for some of the prospects that are there, which is a good thing and a bad thing. I don't know. Speaks to the quality of the partnership and the value. Yeah, it's true. And if I think about one of the things that makes me proud in a kind of more global way about the way that we work is we've probably had four or five occasions over the last several years where we've been working with a client between a couple and four years. And they've come to us and they've said, I have to tell you, we're going to be entering our partnership, but it's because we've actually proven the value of prospect research. And so we're going to be hiring somebody to do this permanently in our organization. And for us, that's like, well, that's that's it. That's success. It's better than that. That's just wonderful, right? I mean, you've proven the value of the work that we do, and now the organization has decided that they're going to hire somebody internally to do that. Win-win. That's fantastic. You've, in many ways, been almost those training wheels, providing value. Yeah. Yeah. So now they're ready to fly on their own. I love that, Helen. And it's a very abundance-based mindset, too. Not like, oh, we're losing a client, but no, they're ready to soar. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, it's what we do. I know that I would say this, but I think that what we do as prospect development professionals truly helps organizations be the most efficient that they can possibly be and get great information in order to be successful. And so if we can help an organization do that with longevity, I mean, our sector is so important. The success of our sector is so important. Yeah. Beautiful. Helen, last official question before we get to our rapid fire. Okay. And that is, we all know that giving through donor advice funds has had incredible growth. In 2021, grants from DAFs to qualified charities totaled about $46 billion, which was a 28% increase over the prior year. And I think the prior year before that was also close to 30% increase. I mean, it's phenomenal. So uh, when I heard that you and your team developed a tool called Definitive, which of course we're going to link in the show notes for folks to check out, Definitive is the only searchable database created to help our listeners, nonprofit professionals, find information about donor advice funds. And that just simply wasn't possible before. Tell us about that tool and how it came to be and what you're seeing as a result of nonprofits engaging with that tool? Sure. Before the pandemic and as the pandemic kind of came about, we really started noticing the number of donor advised funds just increasing exponentially. And then we saw the number of donations that were DAFs that were created in response to the pandemic and then the gifts that were coming out to pandemic related and non-pandemic related, but just the amount, the outpouring of generosity and philanthropy through donor advised funds. And I'd been paying attention to donor advised funds for a couple of years before that and kind of watching them grow and going, 
this is an interesting phenomenon here. I've got a team of 30 researchers. And so as we're doing research, we're sort of gathering our own information, right? We're creating our own resources to help other members of our team to be able to find information more quickly. And as we noticed the number of these staff starting to rise, we decided that we were going to start keeping our own Excel sheet on donor advised funds that we were finding because finding information about donor advised funds has just been incredibly difficult to find. You might find that someone has one because they've made a gift to you through one, but there was no way to sort of check and see if someone had one to begin with when you were starting a conversation with them about giving, finding out how much might be in them or how much they give to or any of that stuff has just been incredibly difficult. So we started gathering this information. And as we did that, we gathered 10,000 funds and then 20,000 funds. And then it started to get bigger and bigger. And then there was a moment when I was thinking, if we're finding this useful and we're gathering this information, it kind of feels a little bit like hoarding to not share it. And if you've been to our website, you will see that there is a research resources page, which I should tell your listeners about because there are just tons and tons and tons of free resources there. You just click through. It's every resource that you could possibly want on finding information, not just about people in the United States, but everywhere in the world. Include it in the show notes for folks to check out. Oh, great. Because they're free resources. You should use them. We love to share resources. And this is another one that we realized that we just needed to get out there, but we couldn't share an Excel spreadsheet. It's kludgy and hard to search. So we ended up making a pretty website, Definitive. And Definitive is really, when we started it, we were sort of thinking that it was by prospect researchers for prospect researchers. And then we realized that frontline fundraisers and everybody in fundraising might be interested in it. So that's why we created Definitive, so that you can use it either as a lookup tool, I'm going to look up the Helen Brown Donor Advised Fund, or you can use it as a prospecting tool. I need to raise money for, and I am an animal rights organization in Florida. And so you can search using different criteria to be able to identify donor advised funds that you might not know yet, or you might, that might be interested in giving to your cause. So thank you for asking about that. And that's yeah, it's and the other thing that we're doing is as we have subscribers that are using it, they're sending us more sponsors and saying, hey, can you get the sponsor in there? And so it's become sort of a crowdsource thing as well, because the answer is yes, we're using it, too. So we want to make sure it's as robust as possible. And we now have over 67,000 donor advised funds and over 175 sponsors. That's really incredible. Yeah, it really speaks to innovation right? Seeing a need, you were innovating for your own team and then thinking others could use this too. I love it. All right, Helen, at the end of each episode, I like to ask a few rapid fire insightful questions to provide just a little extra value for our listeners. Are you ready? All right, first question. What's the best prospect research advice you've ever received? Oh, I would say don't look for a shoe in the refrigerator. That means if you want to take a minute before you look for a piece of information, don't always just go to Google. Think about who might have that information and go straight to that source. So good. Thank you for the translation. That wouldn't have taken me a minute. What book do you recommend to our audience and why? Okay, well, I'm really sorry, but I have to... I have to say this book, we put a lot of good blood, sweat, and tears into this book to help people understand the value of prospect research and what you can do to use it to its best advantage. So prospect research for fundraisers. And I concur. As I said at the top of the show, mine has got little post-it notes and dog ears, and it's a great resource. Yeah. What's your favorite fundraising or prospect research application or tool? And again, feel free to be shameless here if you choose. Well, I hadn't even thought about saying definitive until you mentioned that, but I will say actually LexisNexis. I would have a very difficult time doing my job. Our team would have a hard time doing their job without LexisNexis. Yes. They've been very supportive of our community and, and have just a great product. Excellent. What's your favorite fundraising conference and why? 
I'm going to give a shout out to NEDRA, the New England Development Research Association, which puts on an amazing conference every single year coming up in May. Beautiful. Last one. Knowing what you know now about fundraising and the related research, what advice would you give your younger self just getting started in the profession? I would say be brave. I would say walk towards the things that scare you. Say yes when somebody asks you to do something that you're not quite sure if you can do because if they've asked you to do it, chances are they think you can do it, so you should too. Mm, I love that. Actually, Helen, you gave me the goosebumps. That's how much I love oh. that. <laughs> well, good. So good. Thank you, Helen, for joining us today. Oh, you're very welcome. Thank you so much for asking me. I appreciate it. Yeah, my pleasure. If you want to learn more about Helen, her company, the Helen Brown Group, Definitive, or follow her on social media, we've included links to her handles in the show notes, as well as links to the other resources that we've talked about today. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Intentional Fundraiser Podcast and keep on transforming your fundraising so you can transform the world. And now for a final word from our sponsor. Thank you to our friends at Bloomerang for supporting this episode. If you'd like to learn more about how Bloomerang can help your nonprofit acquire, retain, and engage donors, or learn how First Tea of Greater Akron doubled their unique donors, improved donor stewardship, and raised more funds in the first year with Bloomerang, head over to bloomerang.com forward slash intentional or click the link in the show notes. The Intentional Fundraiser Podcast is a Fundraising Transformed original. It's hosted by me, Tammy Zonker, founder and president of Fundraising Transformed, where we help equip and empower fundraisers, nonprofit leaders, and board members to transform their fundraising so they can transform the world. Visit fundraisingtransform.com slash podcast to subscribe to this podcast and subscribe to my newsletter to get fundraising lessons, tools, and helpful resources delivered straight to your inbox each month. If you want my help with taking your fundraising to the next level, become a member of my Fundraising Transformers community as a growth member and join me live each month where I'll teach you the same strategies I use to lead, train, and coach thousands of nonprofits, social service organizations, healthcare foundations, private schools, colleges, and universities to collectively raise more than a half billion dollars including a single gift of $27.1 million. As a member, you can participate in my Ask Me Anything sessions every month and get answers to your burning questions. Chat with other growth members inside our private and safe online community about what you're working on, struggling with, and share lessons learned. And get instant access to my growing library of on-demand self-paced training classes. New content is added every single month. Learn more about becoming a member at fundraisingtransform.com slash growth. Talk soon.